Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege for me to welcome you, Professor Stiglitz, this afternoon and to the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. We are delighted that you are here to share your thoughts and views with us on how to move towards a more uh, stable economic and financial architecture. As many of you know, Professor Stiglitz is one of the greatest economic thinkers of our time, and I'm delighted that he has ch chosen uh, to share his thoughts with us this afternoon. He has served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to the President of the United States during the Clinton period, and from 1997 to 2000 as Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of the World Bank. Among his many positions and responsibilities, Professor Stiglitz is co-founder and president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, chair of Columbia University's Committee on Global Thought, and the president-elect of the International Economic Association. He was appointed, as many of you know, by the pre French uh, uh, President Sarkozy to co-chair the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress. Professor Stiglitz has made a major contribution to macroeconomics and monetary theory, to development economic and trade theory, and his work has helped explain the circumstances in which markets do not work well, and how selected government interventions can improve their performance. Professor Siglitz has received a Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001 in recognition for his many contributions. Recently, Professor Stiglitz chaired a UN Commission of Experts appointed by the President of the United Nations General Assembly to examine international monetary and financial system reforms required to respond to the current crisis. As the most trade-dependent region in the world, Asia-Pacific has been hard hit. Now, despite the robust economies of India, China, Korea, the average growth rate for developing countries in the Asia-Pacific region has fallen from 8.8% .8 in 2007 to just 2.8% this year. In other words, the real economy is, exper is experiencing decline in export, reduced remittances, lower foreign direct investment, falls in capital flows, and increasing joblessness. The economic gains that helped lift millions out of poverty over the last decade is now under threat. In the 1997 economic crisis, Asia-Pacific was able to trade itself out of the crisis, but currently the G3, the US, Japan, Europe markets, are not where many of the export growth will lead us to, and therefore this time round, the Asia-Pacific region cannot use the same strategy, but in fact, is highly dependent on spending its way out of the crisis. So the need to look at the impact and also the depth of the stimulus packages that have been put in place is another area of work. Professor Siglitz, you have often stressed that we have to be aware of the one-size-fit-all strategies and be aware of the spaces, the different spaces of how countries can maneuver out of different crises. And the Asia-Pacific is a region of great disparities and great inequalities. We look forward to hearing your views on how the UN and Asia-Pacific can deal with this crisis and what we could do to ensure that there is a more stable and supportive development architecture for development. It's the floor is all yours, Professor Sickness. Well, thank you very much and, uh, for this opportunity to talk with you. Uh, this crisis is clearly uh, uh, the, the worst crisis since the, the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, the response to the crisis has been, uh, I think, distinctive, unique. Uh, at the very beginning, it was v quite clear that uh, the kind of global architecture that we had for thinking about responding to global problems was inadequate. Uh, the major forum for discussion was the G8. And uh, the good news was that the G8 recognizes, recognized that it was not up to the task. Uh, and so uh, there was a, 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 a 
call for uh, a G20 meeting first in November in Washington and then a second one in April in in uh, uh, in London. Uh, it it was clear that, as I said, that as a global crisis. Uh, this uh, group of uh, advanced industrial countries, where, which have been the cause of the crisis, whose, mis uh, whose, whose uh, flawed policies have led to the crisis, uh, were not in a position to adequately address uh, the global uh, economic downturn. And yet, uh, there are 192 countries in the world. Uh, 20 is a small percentage. Uh, a little over uh, um, uh, 12%. And obviously, uh, what is necessary to respond to the crisis is not a G20, but a G192. Uh, and the only global institution with legitimacy, inclusive, uh, uh, inclusive approach to these problems is the United Nations. Uh, and so I, I, I would... Uh, uh, welcome the initiative of the President of the General Assembly to uh, put together a uh, international commission of, of experts to uh, analyze uh, the crisis, to talk about what ought to be done, what the causes are, what should be, how we should respond, not only to get a robust recovery, but also to prevent a recurrence. Uh, and we put together a, a, a very interesting, uh, diverse group of people from uh, all over the world, from all uh, 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 from different uh, backgrounds, from finance, from central banks, from the private sector, uh, from the public sector, uh, from uh, uh, several representatives from Africa, uh, all speaking on their own behalf rather than on behalf of the governments. And, and the result is a report that will be in its final form uh, issued uh, uh, later uh, at the beginning of next month uh, in, uh, for, the, for the annual meetings uh, at, at the UN. Uh, a report which I uh, think actually does a better job both of diagnosing what were the problems and coming up with solutions. So what I want to do uh, this, this afternoon is to uh, try to talk a little bit about um, what our diagnosis is and uh, a few of the solutions. It's a long report, uh, over 100 pages, so in a, in, in a few minutes I'm not going to be able to uh, uh, go through everything that, that uh, we said, but I, I want to give you a little flavor of, uh, uh, of at least some of the th uh, perspectives that we try to put forward. Uh, perhaps I should begin uh, by, by uh, giving just a, a, a few uh, general remarks about uh, a set of economic ideas um, that underlay our analysis. Uh, I think the view that all the members of the Commission had by the time we finished our discussion was that um, we can't, we shouldn't go back to uh, the system that we had prior to the crisis. Uh, there are many people who see the major goal of government policy uh, is to reconstruct the world uh, and uh, reconstruct the economy as it existed uh, before in 2007 before the crisis. And I think that would be wrong. Uh, the fact was that there were some fundamental flaws with the way the global economic system worked, that the crisis was not just an accident, and some people try to describe this as, as an accident, it's something that happened to the economy, uh, uh, once in a hundred year flood, how could we have expected it? Uh, the answer was, it was man-made. We made it. And it was the result of policies, flawed policies, and flawed institutions that promoted those policies, both at the national and at the international level. And behind those flawed policies and behind those flawed institutions were a set of economic ideas 
uh, and that if we try to resurrect the world as it was before, we are going to get into problems uh, further down the line. Uh, what I'll try to suggest a little bit as I go through the talk is that in fact, some of the policies being pursued in some of the advanced industrial countries, including my own, have actually made things worse than they were prior to the crisis. And that some of the problems that had led to the crisis have not been addressed, but have actually uh, become worse. And uh, the, the, the reason for this in part was that as we began to address the problems and think about how to get out of the crisis, we focused on the financial markets without realizing the problems beyond the financial markets, but we didn't have a vision of what kind of an economy we wanted to create, and we didn't have a vision of what had gone wrong with our financial system and what we needed to do to get a financial system that was uh, uh, more uh, uh, performed better uh, uh, and so we wouldn't get back into the old problems. Well, uh, as we think about uh, just a, a few of, uh, of, of, of the problems, of reasons we got into, into these difficulties, uh, one of them that comes uh, to the mind was the extent to which uh, there was a reliance on self-regulation of the banks. Uh, to me, self-regulation is an oxymoron. Uh, the notion that banks could self-regulate themselves should have been uh, obviously questioned because in fact, if we look at the history, banks have continually gotten into problems and have continually been saved by the state, by the government. But we made the wrong inference. Because we managed to save them, they said everything was fine. And we didn't need the government, but it was the government that continually saved them. Now, anybody in this region knows about that because they were saved here in the East Asia crisis, uh, where IMF, U.S. Treasury, other ba uh, governments financed bailouts over $100 billion dollars. An amount at the time seemed very large, but of course, relative to the trillions of dollars that the U.S. government has put, it makes everything seem small. Uh, the, the, but, but the fact of the matter was that this was just one of a whole history of bailouts. There was the SNL bailout in the United States in the 80s. There was the Mexican bailout in the mid-90s. There was the uh, um, bailouts of governments in Scandinavia, of their banking systems. There was the bailout of Russia, Indonesia, uh, uh, bailouts uh, in, in Turkey, Argentina, Brazil. Each of these bailouts has a name associated with the country. But the real story of the bailout was they reflect the fact that the financial system made bad judgments about credit worthiness. They didn't do their job. Their fundamental job is to assess who can repay the money that's lent. And they have an enormous history of incompetence. And that is the reality. And they've been saved from their incompetence over and over and over again by government bailouts. And now we've had the biggest bailout of all history. Now, when you see systematic failures of this kind, you can't say it's a once in a hundred year flood. It's something that happens every couple years. You can't say it's because of incompetent people or greed or anything like that. It's almost inevitably a consequence of systemic problems. And the job of a social scientist, of an economist, is to try to understand what are the nature of the systematic, systemic problems that have repeatedly given rise to these failures. These failures which have cost taxpayers so much and have led to such suffering, suffering all over the world. Well, Part of this has to do with, with an understanding of the limits of markets, 
as well as their strengths. Uh, my own work, one of the things I focused on are the fact that markets often don't succeed in giving efficient outcomes. Uh, even when they're efficient, they don't re there's no economic theory that ever said that they would give outcomes that are socially just, uh, fair in any particular way. But the argument was put by some people that they were at least efficient. Now, this was the view that was put forward, of course, by Adam Smith, uh, in which uh, he argued that the pursuit of self-interest led as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of society. Well, the pursuit of greed by our bankers did not lead to the well-being of America or the world. Uh, my own work on problems associated with imperfect and asymmetric information showed that the reason that the invisible hand often seemed invisible was that it wasn't there. <laughs> that, in fact, markets are in general, without government regulation, not efficient. And we have just seen the most dramatic illustration of that. One of the reasons is, of course, that there are externalities. Actions by one party have effects on others. We see that so clearly in the case of this crisis. The actions of the financial market have had enormous effects on the real sector, on our taxpayers, on our homeowners, on our workers, every aspect of our society, but not just in America. The whole world has suffered as a result of the mistakes of America's financial institutions. That is really an example of an externality. They have imposed enormous cost, which they don't bear the result. They're even balking at paying for the cost of their own bailouts. So th this is a, a real example. When, you, when there are costs that you don't bear, you don't get efficient outcomes. Now, in the response to the crisis, uh, the Bush and Obama administration have come forward with a, a new concept uh, that I call uh, ersox capitalism, uh, where you socialize the losses and you privatize the gains. Uh, this kind of capitalism doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't give the right incentives and the outcomes are not efficient. Uh, and there is no economic theory that would support this as a basis of a sound economic system. Uh, the United States and other governments have been held up to ransom. As the financial markets were collapsing, they pointed a gun at the government and they said, if you don't give us the trillions of dollars that we demand, we will collapse and you will suffer even more. And uh, the American government gave in to the blackmail. Uh, I'll come back, if I have time later, to whether the threat was, was really valid. But whether it was or was not, what it means is the system was able, to, the, the financial system was able to hold the American econ government for hostage. Now you would have thought you would have thought that having seen that happen, the first response would be, we will not allow ourselves to be held hostage again. Why were we being held, held hostage? Because we had banks that were too big to fail. In fact, they brought up a new concept, too big to be resolved. Too big for the ordinary rules of capitalism to prevail. The ordinary rules of capitalism say that if you owe more than you can pay, you go bankrupt. Your shareholders get wiped out. Your bondholders become the new shareholders. In the case of a bank, the preservation of the payment system is viewed to be so important that the government will step in to keep the institutions going. But they said, no, we can't play by the rules of capitalism. What we want to do is not only save the banks, but we have to save the bankers. <laughs> we have to save the shareholders. We have to save the bondholders. We eliminated all market discipline from the shareholders to the bondholders 
we got rewards as if there was risk, but we said there's no risk. We will bail you out. So what we've done, in effect, is undermine totally the nature of the market economy. As I said, if you had realized this, what would be your first response? Not let this happen again. So you would start to break up the too big to fail, too big to be resolved institutions. You would limit the risk taking so that they wouldn't be able to hold the economy at ransom again. But what have we done? We've allowed our too big to fail banks become even bigger. The share of their of them in the uh, uh, in the financial sector to become even more concentrated. We poured money into the too big to fail banks and let the smaller banks fail. The banks that were actually doing lending to small enterprises, the banks that actually made our economy go, the institutions that actually were providing the money to the enterprises that are the vital part of our economy. And we put the money into the big investment banks and that are involved in gambling. Where did the profits show up in the recent reports of the big investment banks? In accounting changes, which is more deception, and in trading profits, which is another name for gambling, not in lending activities. So the bottom line out of all of this is because we didn't have a vision of what was wrong, we went about trying to repair the financial system and we did it in ways not to that meant that we are now even more exposed to the problems less protected from a recurrence than we were before well the simple point of all this is that markets on their own do not necessarily work as well as those who advocated liberalization, deregulation said. In fact, uh, the, not only was ext the, the extremes of deregulation responsible for the creation of the crisis, capital market liberalization and financial market liberalization help spread uh, the problems from the United States around the world uh, in a very short order. So uh, what we need to do as we approach the problem, as I said, is to have a vision of where we want our economies to go, where we want our societies to go, and an understanding of why it is that markets, not just in this instance, but in many other instances, have failed fail to be self-correcting, fail to produce efficient outcomes. Now, as we uh, emerge from the crisis, we want, as I said, not only to, to think about what kind of a financial system we want, but also what kind of society we want. Uh, to a too large extent, we have, I think, engaged in what I could sometimes call GDP fetishism. Uh, we've focused too much on GDP. GDP is a bad measure of economic progress, of social progress, of economic performance. Uh, we know that the patterns of consumption, of living, that prevail in the United States and some other countries are not sustainable. Our planet will not survive if the rest of the world imitates those patterns of consumption. We've treated as if they were free goods some of our scarcest resources, our environmental resources, the air, the water that surround us. And that means that we really, as we recover from, from this crisis, ought to begin to think a little bit about what kinds of economy what kinds of societies do we want to create? Uh, the kind of, of economy that the United States had was not sustainable. And we've seen that. It wasn't sustained. But that general pattern of consumption itself is not sustainable. And it won't be sustained. So uh, I think 
that is, uh, uh, these are among uh, the, br the, the, the broader lessons uh, that we need uh, to take to heart. Now, when we think about uh, what went wrong uh, in our economy, uh, while we often focus on the problems of, of the financial markets, uh, inadequate regulation, what I want to do and spend a few minutes here talking about some of the underlying problems, uh, problems that will persist even after we fix the financial system. Analyzing this crisis is very complex and it's in many ways like peeling an onion. Every time you get an explanation, there's another explanation behind it. Uh, and I want to begin with the, the broad, uh, while this is a financial crisis, it's also an economic crisis. Uh, and, and I think we have, uh, need to understand a little bit about the underlying economics. Underlying the problem is uh, a lack of aggregate demand, an insufficiency of aggregate demand at the global level. Now, there's something very peculiar about this situation, uh, and the fact that it is uh, so severe and so global in nature uh, suggests uh, a fundamental problem with the global economic system itself. Uh, in the United States, I, I mentioned the fact before that, that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a large number of people, uh, we, we have a problem of, of uh, uh, a large number of foreclosures. Um, Last month, the number of foreclosures reached a new record of over 300,000. There are two and a half million uh, homes in the process of being foreclosed. Already, uh, more than two million to three million homes have already been foreclosed. Uh, we have, in short, not only a, an economic problem, we also have a social problem. But we have, uh, in addition, a, a peculiar situation we have a country in which we have hundreds of thousands of empty homes and hundreds of thousands of homeless people. But our global economy is in the same situation. We have a lack of aggregate demand. But it's also the case that we have enormous unmet needs. We have needs associated with poverty, global poverty. We have needs uh, associated with meeting the, uh, uh, adapting to the problem of climate change. Uh, we have uh, huge amounts of needs. And so we have this disjunction between a world in which we have excess supply and a world in which we have unmet needs. And the fact that our economic system can't bring together this excess supply and our unmet needs suggest that there is something wrong and we ought to give some thought to what that is. Why is there the problem of the lack of global aggregate demand? Well, there are two factors. Uh, at the, in most countries around the world, there's been a large increase in inequality. In effect, we've redistributed money from people who would spend it, people at the bottom, to people at the top, people who have more money than they need and aren't spending at all. Uh, the result of that is, uh, is that at the national level, in many countries, there is uh, this lack of demand. It happened very uh, acutely in the United States. In the United States, uh, before the crisis, in 2007, most Americans had a lower income than they had in 1999. So there was growth, but all, all of the growth went to the people at the top. A majority of Americans have had their incomes fall over a large number of years. No progress at all. Well, the response in America was to say, don't worry if you have no income, continue to spend as if you did have income. <laughs> well, it's an interesting idea. It required borrowing, debt, and the Fed helped this by creating a bubble. 
and the housing bubble uh, went on. People could feel very good about it. They took money out of their house and they had a consumption boom. But as one of my predecessors, uh, as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors said, that which is not sustainable won't be sustained and this debt finance bubble was not sustainable and it was not sustained. Uh, so that's the first problem. I'm going to come back to that in a second. The second problem is that is is in a way uh, uh, a consequence of the way that the IMF and the U.S. Treasury mismanaged the East Asia crisis. Uh, the response to the way that the crisis was mismanaged where recessions were turned into depressions, countries lost their economic sovereignty, was that in many developing countries, they said, we don't want this to happen again. We need to have enough reserves so that we don't turn, have to turn to the IMF. The leader of one of the countries in this region told me very bluntly, he said, we were in the class of 97. We learned what happened if you don't have enough reserves. Uh, we don't want this to happen ever again. And the result of that is that the amount of reserves have increased into the trillions. Now, why is that a problem? Well, it does increase the economic security. But it was money that's not being spent. Every year, about $500, trillion, uh, $500 billion of income is, in effect, buried in the ground and not spent. And that leads to a lack of aggregate demand at the global level. So uh, these are at least two of the underlying problems. Now, why have I emphasized this? I, the reason I've emphasized this is even after the United States repairs its banks, which it's not doing a very good job of, even if our banks were working perfectly, we are not going to go back to the world as it was before 2007. In the United States, savings rate was zero. It was zero because people thought they were getting wealthier and wealthier because their house prices were going up. But it was all a mirage. It was a fantasy. And they now know that. If a savings rate is zero, that means roughly half the people have negative savings rate. They were living beyond their means. America as a country, the richest country in the world, was living beyond its means, borrowing about 5, 6, 7 percent of its GDP a year abroad. It's not clear that other countries are going to want to lend to the United States to live beyond its means. One of the reasons they were lending the United States is they thought they knew how to manage capital well. I don't think anybody believes that anymore. So the willingness to lend will also change. Well, that means that even after America's banks are repaired, there's going to be a weakness in aggregate demand within the United States. It's going to be very difficult for investment to fill the gap until consumption gets restored. It's going to be very difficult for the U.S. to export its way out of the problem. In the East Asia crisis, the countries could recover very quickly because there was the rest of the world to export to. But when the whole world is in a crisis, there's no one to export to. Mars demand is still limited. So the, the, the possibility of, of export is, is, quite frankly, very limited. And even government, consum government spending within the United States is uh, prospect is limited. It's been very strong, but actually not as strong as many people think because while the U.S. has had a uh, $800 billion stimulus at the federal level, at the state and local level, there's contraction. U.S. has a federal system. The states have a balanced budget framework. 
their revenues are down by over $200 billion per year. And when their revenues are down, they have to contract. So over a two-year period, that's 400, more than $400 billion. That's offsetting almost 50% of the stimulus package. So when you see a very big stimulus package, don't be misled. It's, it's being offset by what's happening at the state and local level. But the real problem is 2011. When the federal stimulus ends, there is a need for a second stimulus. But because of the way that the money was misspent on the bank, bank bailout, it's going to be very difficult to get a second round of stimulus. So all of that says that uh, potential for a robust recovery within the United States is limited. But part of the problem is that we haven't done anything about the two underlying problems, the growing inequality that I mentioned within most countries of the world or the problem of uh, the reserves, the growth of global reserves. Well, let me uh, switch now to, to a, a discussion of uh, some of the UN report and, and, and our recommendations on how to respond uh, to, to the crisis. Uh, what I want to do in this limited amount of time is to try to d talk about some of the ways in which our report is similar and some of the ways in which it differs from the G20. When I think that helps highlight some of the advantages of having a more inclusive approach to global decision making. Uh, the fundamental problem that we highlight is that this is a global crisis, but the responses to the crisis are being framed at the national level. And because we have a globally integrated economy, the actions of one country have effects on others. Negatively, as I saw talked about in the case of the U.S. financial mistakes, the U.S. exported its not only exported its deregulatory philosophy, it exported its toxic mortgages, and now has exported its recessions. These are negative externalities. Uh, stimulus packages have a positive externality. If you rekindle your economy, it will be able to grow, it will import more goods, and that will help other countries. The problem is that each country frames its policies focusing on its own well-being and not of the externalities. And you can see that most uh, uh, critically or most clearly in the case of the stimulus packages. Each country looks at the cost and benefits to itself. Uh, the cost is the increase in the national deficit, for instance. The benefit is the stimulation to the economy. But the national stimulation is markedly, markedly different from the global stimulus. Uh, we call those leakages. The national multipliers in a country like the United States is like one and a half. But the global multiplier is almost surely over two. For a small country, the national multiplier is almost one. It gets very little extra benefit, but the global multiplier is much larger. There's a tendency of small countries to say, let's be free riders. One of the small countries actually said that. We're going to be a free rider. Why should we get a deficit? If we spend more money, they'll just import more goods. So we'll just wait for the rest of the world to recover. Then we'll have less of a deficit and we'll be in a better stance. Well, obviously, if everybody does this, the world won't recover. So that's the first point, that, that uh, the national multipliers are much smaller than the global multipliers. The second point is that each country has an incentive to look at packages that have the biggest effects on itself. So you can design stimulus packages which maximize your own benefit but have less of a spillover. 
The worst aspect of those, are, of course, are examples of protectionism. Beggar thy neighbor policies, where you try to help yourself at the expense of your neighbors. Uh, the result of countries following these policies is that the global recovery will be slower, the global response will be smaller, and the downturn will last longer than it otherwise would have. The worst examples, as I said before, were protectionism, and it was good news that the G20 in Washington agreed not to engage in protectionism. But within a few months, 17 of the 20 countries have reneged on that promise. Uh, a few of the developing countries, like South Africa, were the examples of those who did not renege. They kept up the promises. But the United States was among those that reneged. It passed a stimulus package with a Buy America provision. But it was worse than that, and that illustrates some of the difficulties of uh, globalization today. They said, we'll buy America except when there is an international agreement. Well, that sounds pretty good, except for the fact that you realize that the government procurement agreements between the United States and other countries are almost exclusively between the United States and other advanced industrial countries. So when they put that agreement in, what they said was, we're going to discriminate only against poor countries that are the innocent victims of our own mistakes. So, that, so we'll buy from Europe, we'll buy from Canada, but we won't buy from developing countries. So that was the America stimulus package. But this went on in many other countries as well. I, I, it was just that America's was much more visible in its uh, package. Well, uh, what is clear is in, in, uh, that, that if we're going to have uh, a, a, an effective global response, it has to be global. And again, one of the good aspects of the G20 was a recognition that some of the poorer countries didn't have the resources to respond in a way comparable to the United States. They also realized that, in effect, the way the advanced industrial countries were responding was totally destroying the level playing field. That the developing countries couldn't match the guarantees, the subsidies, the bailouts, that the U.S. and Europe were offering. What was interesting at the beginning of the crisis was that the European Commissioner on Competition said the kinds of guarantees that Ireland is offering represent unfair competition. It's true. But what they should have gone on and say the guarantees that the U.S. and Europe all over were offering represent unfair competition the developing countries can't match. The result of this is the peculiar situation of much of the money in the media months after the crisis was going from the developing countries back to the United States from where the origin crisis originated because the government guarantees in the United States were more credible than the guarantees that might have been offered by the developing countries. And because of financial market liberalization, there was financial protectionism, money was withdrawn to the home country in a, lot, uh, in a number of uh, 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 banking institutions, uh, which, all of which exacerbated uh, the crisis. So the, the, um, uh, it was recognized, as I say, that the developing countries did not have the capacity to match the stimulus package, the bailouts. We had destroyed the level playing field. It may have been a question about whether there were, ever was a level playing field, but there was no longer any question. Uh, and the fact that the developed countries stand willing to bail out their firms means that even firms that are not being bailed out have a competitive advantage because they know that if they undertake more risk and they make a mistake, they can get bailed out. So we really have destroyed the level playing field. We should be very clear about that. 
and resurrecting the world as it was before is going to be very, very difficult. Well, uh, the problem was to try to get an adequate funds to the developing countries so they can have an appropriate stimulus package. And here again, they made two critical mistakes. The G20 made two critical mistakes. The first was they fo put a focus entirely on loans. The reason why I say that's a mistake is because many of the poorest countries are just emerging from a period of excess debt bur burden. There was the debt forgiveness. And the, they don't want to get back into an overhang of debt that impaired their development in the past. But all that the West offered, or at least most of what the West offered, was more short-term loans. And unfortunately, this is going to be a long-term crisis. Short-term loans won't get them through. The second problem is they turned to the same institutions that have promoted the policies of financial deregulation and capital market liberalization that had caused the crisis and that had led to its rapid spread around the world. These were institutions that had, did not have the confidence either of the borrowers or of those countries that had pools of reserves that they could recycle to help the developing countries. What was needed were new forms of disbursement uh, 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 to uh, get funds to the developing countries. So what our commission called for were two recommendations. One, more grants rather than loans, and the creation of an international credit facility, a new credit facility to help take money from, uh, get money from those countries that had uh, uh, some uh, surpluses and get them to those countries that needed, that would have more confidence of both the lenders and the borrowers and had a governing structure to reflect the 21st century rather than uh, a governing structure that goes back uh, to the middle of the last century. Uh, so that, those were two of the important uh, recommendations. Now, obviously, the failure of the financial institutions are uh, key to understanding this crisis, and uh, I don't have time to go through all the recommendations, but I want to give you a, a flavor of, of at least two or three of the issues that, that we grappled with, which the G20 have not dealt with adequately. The first of these is the too big to fail, too big to be resolved institutions. That's an issue that has to be addressed. It was not even on the G20 uh, issue uh, agenda in, in either Washington or London. For obvious reasons, the big banks in America don't want this issue to be on the agenda. Uh, the um, second issue that uh, needed to be addressed is the issue of uh, the uh, transparency, uh, the uh, excessive risk-taking of uh, the uh, large institutions, uh, the credit default swaps uh, and derivatives, uh, what Warren Buffett would call uh, financial weapons of mass destruction. Uh, What has been proposed was everybody agrees that the, most of the trading of these should be over exchanges uh, and more transparent. Uh, the, that's not the issue. Uh, what the Obama administration proposed was that there remain an alternative of over-the-counter non-transparent derivatives. Now, if you give a bank a choice between being transparent and non-transparent, what do you think it's going to do? <laughs> so what they say is, okay, we finally persuaded them, you ought to give them a little incentive for in transparency, a little bit. But we don't know now whether it's going to be adequate. If you give them a choice to be transparent or non-transparent and you don't give them enough of incentive, everything will go through the non-transparent 
uh, agenda uh, through, uh, through the non-transparent uh, channel. Uh, so uh, what I want to emphasize is that these credit default swaps, these non-transparent derivatives are not a minor issue. There's been a lot of discussion about the problems of the mortgages, but America has spent $180 billion bailing out one company, all because of credit default swaps. So that is, you, you, this is uh, not a minor thing. And, uh, you know, uh, these numbers are so large that it's, it's hard to, it, it, they're mind-boggling. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I often, uh, you know, try to get people to try to understand what, what a number of $180 billion going to one company bailout means. But uh, to put it in perspective, uh, a few uh, months before the bailout, Congress passed a bill to provide health insurance for poor children in America who didn't have health insurance, who might get sick and as a result of that be scarred for life. And President Bush vetoed the bill because he said we could not afford it. And he was talking about a few billion dollars a year. We could not afford a few billion dollars a year. And then a few months later, he found $180 billion for one company. So it gives you a little perspective that even in a rich country, $180 billion is a lot of money. And that there are trade-offs and that we've not clearly been, I think, not been making uh, some of these trade-offs uh, in the right way. The third example in, in regulation that I want to uh, mention is, uh, and it highlights the difference, would, a difference it would have made had there been more developing countries in the G20. Uh, there's not a single sub-Saharan African country other than South Africa, which is uh, somewhat different from the position of other sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, they made a big deal about the, what they call non-compliant states for uh, tax evasion. So we're going to do something about it. And then the next day, the OECD said, oh, all the countries are compliant. It tells you something about the standard they were setting. But the point is that for many developing countries, the issue is not just tax evasion, it's corruption. That because people can take, dictators can take money out of a country find a safe harbor, not just an offshore, but in some big onshore money centers, knowing that when they get thrown out of office, they can go have a big, nice pool of money to live comfortably there ever after, encourages, encourages corruption. Developing countries like Nigeria are demanding or asking for the return of money that they've discovered have been taken out of their country by these corrupt leaders, but major banking centers, including one of those in which the meeting was held, have refused to turn this money over. Now, this is the kind of issue if you had had developing countries at the G20 meeting would have been raised. It's not just a question of tax evasion. Tax evasion is important, but it's also money laundering, corruption. And in the outcome document of the UN meeting that was in June, this was one of the issues that was listed, uh, that was highlighted uh, in, uh, in addition to the tax evasion issue, and it shows what the advantage of having a, 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 an international forum uh, can have. Uh, the third set of uh, issues that the, uh, the UN Commission dealt with are the issues of global governance. Reforms of the Bretton Woods institutions, well-known, very slow. Uh, I'm not going to comment on them. But the most important idea was the idea of creation of a global economic coordinating council that would uh, be more representative, uh, that would not only provide the coordination and coherence that is necessary, but also identify lacuna in the global economic architecture. 
Uh, and there are lots of problems. We need a global competition policy. We need a global bank to do something about sovereign debt restructuring mechanisms, something that was on the agenda until the United States tried to get it off the agenda. Uh, Cross-border bankruptcies have made the resolution of some of the uh, uh, international banking problems more difficult. Uh, there, there are a host of issues that globalization requires be dealt with. Uh, globalization has meant the countries of the world have become more economically integrated, more interdependent. When, we, when the national economies were created 150 years ago, there was concurrently the creation of appropriate regulatory authorities to deal with bank regulation, competition, all the other things that make a national economy work. We've now created a global economy, but we haven't created the global institutions to make that global economy work. And uh, the Global Economic Coordinating Council would highlight those missing elements, make proposals for how to deal with them, and hopefully move the agenda forward. Uh, uh, they've also proposed the creation of the idea of a global ex uh, international expert panel along the role with a notion of the important role that the IPCC, the expert panel on climate change, played in the, uh, bringing attention to what needed to be done about climate change. The final set of, of uh, proposals uh, of the commission uh, focus on uh, more innovative approaches, more uh, variety of innovations in the global economic architecture. And uh, there's only one of those that I have time to deal with uh, this afternoon, and that is the global reserve system. It's clear that the current system isn't working. The current system is a dollar-based reserve, global reserve system. Uh, the dollar is not a st good store of value. Uh, dollar now is yielding almost zero return. And anybody looking at the buildup of America's deficit and debt and the blowing up of the balance sheet of the Fed has to feel a little bit of risk going forward. Uh, the Fed says, don't worry. We will deftly take out excess liquidity just as needed. But anybody who's watched the Fed in the last 10 years will not believe that it is quite that deft. Uh, so uh, there is good reason for anxiety. Maybe they will uh, uh, avoid uh, uh, inflation, but perhaps at the expense of having a, a, a W, uh, another recession. Uh, but perhaps they will wish to avoid that and will have inflation. But in whatever... Uh, Whatever, uh, what, whatever uh, case may be, uh, the likelihood that they'll manage it uh, exactly right is uh, very small. The current global reserve system, as I said, is fraying. And it's very hard to have a world of uh, global re global globally integrated financial system based on a single currency where there is uh, such uh, uncertainty about the economic fortunes of that particular country. The problem is that a two or three current country currency reserve system may be even more unstable than a single currency system. And so we have to ha go to a global reserve system. And uh, our uh, commission uh, uh, described uh, how that might be done. Um, it described, explained why uh, this would be good for global aggregate demand, why it would be good for uh, global stability. It would also be good for global equity because in effect right now the developing countries are lending to the United States trillions of dollars at zero interest rate. You can think of this as a form of foreign aid. Uh, 
to the United States. And one might argue that the United States needs some foreign aid under the current circumstances. It's had a hard eight years under President Bush, and uh, the crisis has put us into another period of hard times. But there's still a certain kind of inequity of the richest country of the world receiving foreign aid from the poorest countries of the world, uh, foreign aid far larger than the foreign aid that it itself gives. Uh, so on all three accounts, I think there is a compelling case for a global reserve system. The idea is an old one. Keynes talked about this uh, very persuasively 75 years ago. I think it's a time, uh, an idea whose time has come. And uh, the fact that after we proposed the idea, it's received a lot of resonance and a lot of support from countries like China means that it is likely to be on the agenda going forward. Again, uh, the, UN commission, the UN in its meeting in June uh, 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 made note of the fact that uh, a number of countries uh, have been advocating uh, beginning of discussions uh, of this issue. Well, let me just conclude and, and, and say that, that uh, a crisis like this uh, is an, and should be a, a time of reflection it should be clear that there are some major problems in our global financial architecture. Uh, hopefully, uh, we will uh, uh, take this occasion to think about why the system works so poorly and has worked poorly for many countries. Some countries have done quite well uh, over the last 25 years, and we should recognize that the system uh, has uh, enabled uh, support of the growth of a few countries, uh, and particularly countries in East Asia. But it also has confronted even the country, even those countries, many of those countries, with a high level of instability. Uh, so as we think about uh, this crisis, we think about the world that will emerge after the crisis, uh, I think it is a good time for us to think about how we can create a global economic architecture which uh, works uh, better uh, for more people and uh, in a more sustainable way uh, than the kind of economic structures that we had prior to the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Stiglitz, for that very inspiring talk. I'm going to open uh, the floor up, but uh, before that, I just uh, wanted to say that uh, in Asia Pacific, um, besides uh, using this, this as a time of reflection, the countries have also used it as a time of opportunity to rethink uh, the economies of the, the uh, future and also to put in place some of the foundations that needed to be built in terms of building a more risk-averse uh, communities uh, that can, in fact, deal with the issues of volatility as much as with wealth generation. And um, uh, some of the issues that came up during the Commission sessions of ESCAP uh, over the last two years have been very significant. Uh, there has been a discussion about the need to build a social foundation of protection systems, and not just as a way of dealing with uh, the issue of uh, uh, kind of vulnerability, but as a way of an economic stimulus, uh, because it's only if you have income security based on that uh, social protection system can you begin to even stimulate some of the regional markets. So that's uh, point one. And the other one is even to re rethink, to push uh, the whole discussion on a development pathway uh, that l leads to a, even a discussion of a new development paradigm. And uh, discussions that have emerged in the region included issues of low carbon, more resource efficient growth. And um, that would be more inclusive. And I have a shape and a, an agenda based with, uh, on the inputs of member states towards a more inclusive and sustainable development agenda for the Asia-Pacific region that takes into account the participation and the needs of the least developed countries, the landlocked countries. 
And the, the issue here is, of course, that if we cannot anymore trade ourselves out of the crisis as in the 1997, um, then uh, or use the, this model of development where you have uh, manufacture cheaply in Asia but consume in America, then you need to have another model of growth. And that would be uh, one whereby the, the region becomes more integrated with itself than with the rest of the world. And in fact, Asia, unfortunately, happens to be one of the regions where it is more integrated with the rest of the world than with itself. And they have a tremendous opportunity to build up the areas of connectivity. And here, the issues of transportation, the in the modal uh, transport that we've been pushing, the issue of trade facilitation, uh, the issue of even uh, energy security, and a, a discussion, in fact, the last commission session, not, not this year, but last year, talked even about energy security and a trans-Asian energy grid. Very, very interesting discussion. As we move towards a sustainable uh, 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 environmental um, uh, issues as well, I think uh, there's also a discussion of bringing back the three imbalances. So how do, you, how do you develop a more integrated development agenda that addresses what are the critical challenges of Asia in the 21st century? And this happens to be the fact that, as you mentioned, uh, the fact that there is growing economic inequalities, and that's bad uh, for, the, for, for long-term uh, sustainable growth. Uh, the issue of social disparities, um, the fact that uh, you still have very marginalized populations with no social protection, and the, the, the whole area of ecological imbalances because we have not valued the gifts of the earth and we've taken that uh, for, for granted. So, 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 so the issue of bringing back a more balanced development agenda that is more inclusive and sustainable has been one of the major discussions here. I just um, uh, wanted to also say that what struck me at that June meeting, uh, Professor Siglitz, uh, besides the issues that you raised, was well, also a very uh, exciting idea, I thought, of uh, look, the, the whole reform of the economic and financial architecture is a huge job, and it's going to be a long-term uh, effort. And where are the pieces that are doable that can be put in place? And to look at that, at the doable pieces from the perspective of the, most, uh, of the poorest countries uh, that are more debt-prone, that, that, that debt if you like, because it's not just a case of loss of jobs, but it's also the case of the loss of development revenue. And therefore, the whole discussion I thought what, that was interesting to me was that of an extended debt relief and also the development of a debt arbitration court. And I was wondering uh, what you thought of that, because that, um, especially for many of the least developed countries, is something that would be interesting. Now with that from my side, let me now open it up um, to the rest of the house. and. Uh